A very good afternoon to all. Professor Lim Chong Ya and Professor Lim Pin, founding and past chairman, National Wages Council. Mr. Peter Xia, chairman, National Wages Council. Ms. Diana Chia, advisor for the Tripartite Collective. Professor Danny Kwa, dean, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this afternoon's Tripartite Collective Dialogue. Tripartism in Action, Wage Policies to Support Economic Growth. My name is Barry, and I'm delighted to be your MC for this afternoon's Tripartite Collective Dialogue Session. Now, before we begin uh, this afternoon's program and we dive into it, I'd like to bring us through a little safety um, emergency procedures, right? And in the event of a fire safety or fire alarm activation or an emergency, let's remain calm, right? And let's walk orderly, turn turn around, exit via the entrance that we came in on the facing back to our right sides and exit to the assembly area just <coughs> opposite the entrance at the grass patch behind the flag poles. And once we're there at the assembly area, let's wait further instructions for the next course of action. Now, thank you for tuning in for the safety message. Now, for the team of this afternoon's a session and event really is tripartism in action, wage policies to support economic growth. And when we think of wages and tripartism, the platform that naturally pops in our minds is the National Wages Council, or NWC in short. And NWC was set up in 1972 to facilitate social dialogue among the government, labour unions and employer associations on wage-related issues. And this year actually marks the 50th anniversary of the National Wages Council. And there's no better time than right now to look back on the achievements of the NWC and explore the inner workings of tripartism in wage setting negotiations. And we're very proud to have collaborated with the NWC and Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy to commission a case study which explores how the tripartite approach is instrumental in the negotiation of annual wage guidelines which supported both employers and workers through times of uncertainty and economic crisis and how it facilitates the realisation of national priorities through wage policies that support Singapore's continual economic restructuring. So today's program includes a sharing of this case study by the case study unit of Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, followed by two panel discussions featuring movers and shakers from the past and present tripartite leadership. <clears throat> We'd also like to invite us to be part of these discussions. If you have any questions concerning tripartism or the National Wages Council, you can approach the mics along the aisle or raise your hand and we'll bring a mic, mic microphone to you, but only at a question and answer section at the panel later. Now, before we formally start, we would also like to thank each and every one of us for setting time aside for today's tripartite collective dialogue session. And we hope that you'll be able to take away many valuable insights by the end of this session and help shape our tripartite, tripartite movement together. And it is my pleasure now to invite, to start the event and invite Mr. Peter Xia, Chairman, National Wages Council, to deliver the welcome remarks. Mr. Peter Xia, please. Good afternoon, tripartite partners, fellow brothers and sisters from Ministry of Manpower, National Trade Union Congress, Singapore National Employers Federation, Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends. <clears throat> it is indeed a great pleasure for me to come to be able to be invited to deliver this opening address. Today's tripartite collective dialogue on Singapore's wage policies is indeed very timely. The tripartite collective was launched earlier this year in May and actually brought about academia and all players to discuss a very important role and very timely because the National Wish Council celebrated its 50th anniversary this year. The NWC 
is Singapore's first and premier tripartite platform. Today we gather to reflect on how far we have come over the years. The 50 years that NWC was in existence mirrored 50 years of Singapore's outstanding progress and really our journey from third world to first. This journey brought together the government, employer and union members to work together to achieve the longer term goals of the country. Beyond developing the wage and wage related guidelines, the NWC being the first formal tripartite platform also set a reference point for the evolution of social dialogue and partnership among businesses, unions, workers, and the government. I was asked just now, casually, about Singapore's tripartism and why it's worked so well. And my simple answer is that Singapore has got no choice. We are a country without natural resources. We are a country that only has is one single resource, people. So if the people in Singapore don't come together to work together for productivity, for efficiency, and to achieve business and national goals. Nothing can happen. We have no oil and gas, no timber, no power oil. So we only have ourselves. And perhaps this need to survive brought everybody together and makes tripartism work. Indeed, today Singapore is among the countries with the highest GDP per capita and income levels in the world. Investors are able to create good jobs as they are assured of strong and stable support from the government, a globally competitive workforce, progressive unions which take into care of workers and ensure good employer-employee relationships. In turn, this has enabled us to improve the standard of living and quality of lives for Singaporeans. This, as you know, as I said, did not happen by chance. And one of the key factors is our successful tripartism. By adopting our unique tripartite approach, we build trust and respect among the stakeholders principally government, employers, and employees. This coming together has allowed us to achieve win-win solutions for all parties. Tripartism, indeed, is our way to success. The NWC will continue to let collaborate with tripartite partners to develop suitable wage and wage-related guidelines and ensure the sustainability of Singapore's economic growth as well as social progress for our workers. To ensure that the lessons learned in tripartism in the context of wage setting are not lost, the NWC's support, the Tripartite Collective, has partnered the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy to commission a uniquely Singaporean case study. Sorry, you missed the pages. 
tripartism in which setting and which flexibility. This case study talks about the strong reservoirs of trust forged among the government, employees and employers throughout the years, which enable us to reach a unanimous consensus on wage and wage related policies. And the change in NWC stance on qualitative, qualitative versus quantitative wage guidelines over the years to help raise the wages of low wage workers. Which guidelines are especially relevant today as Singapore is currently facing drill headwinds of inflation and slowing growth? And the guidelines help to ensure that wage increases are in line with our productivity and economic performance. I hope that this case study and the dialogue will enable us to learn and apply the best practices and lessons learned from the past. On that note, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to NTUC, SNEF, the unions and employee associations for their tireless work in reaching out to the ground and rallying their constituents to support the wage policies that have been carefully designed and reinvented over time to remain relevant. The Tripartite Collective has organized a good program today. Kok Ho from LKY School will share the salient findings of the case study, followed by two panel sessions featuring my very much respected predecessors, Prof Lim Chong Yai and Prof Lim Pin as well as current tripartite leaders. I encourage you to also network during the break and build new friendships at this event. For after all, the success of NWC was founded strongly on the friendship of the three parties. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Xiang. Please take your seats on the stage. And now for the first segment for this afternoon's program, Dr. Ng Kok Ho, Head of Case Study Unit, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, will share the salient findings of the case study, Tripartism in Which Setting and Which Flexibility, a Singapore case study which explores how tripartism supports national wage negotiation and wage setting policies. This study is complemented with interviews from po prominent policymakers and key individuals who have direct involvement in wage-related deliberations and gleans insights on the delicate and complex process of wage negotiations, allowing us to understand its challenges and ultimately what it takes to establish, to reach a win-win-win outcome. It is now my pleasure to call upon Dr. Ng Kok Ho to deliver his presentation. Dr. Ng, please. Good afternoon, um, everyone, and a warm welcome to Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to today share with you the case study uh, that we developed in collaboration with the Tripartite Collective. I'd like to begin by uh, registering our, our deep gratitude to colleagues at the Tripartite Collective, uh, Felix and team. Um, while it was a close collaboration, they also allowed us to develop the case independently and arrive at our own findings. Um, most of all, they helped us to, uh, they helped to make possible uh, a series of interviews with very important people in Singapore's history of tripartism. These interviews form the, the backbone of our case study, so uh, I would like to acknowledge our thanks to, to all of them. Uh, including Ms. Chang Hui Fong, Mr. Obek Kam, 
Mr. Ko Juan Kiet, Mr. Stephen Lee, Ms. Mary Liu, Ms. Lim Boon Heng, Professor Lim Chong Ya, uh, Professor Lim Pin, Mr. Lim Sui Se, Ms. Ong Yen He, Mr. Peter Xia, and Dr. Robert Yap. Uh, some of you are, are with us in the audience today. Uh, thank you very much. This case study will, from, uh, from here onwards, be used in our classrooms and our causes uh, and, and contribute to the education of future public servants. Um, it will also form part of the do policy documentation work uh, that is so important to us here at the school. Um, I understand that shortly after this event, in the coming days, um, the Tripartite Collective will make the case available uh, on their website, I believe, uh, and we will also be publishing the case uh, on the LKY School's case study library, uh, freely accessible online. So let me begin. We set out to write a case study to document um, Singapore's tradition of tripartism. Uh, since Singapore's independence in 1965, um, the national story has very, bit, very much been a story of economic growth uh, driven by rapid industrialization uh, and economic competitiveness. Underlying this story um, has been a philosophy of tripartism by which we are referring to continual social dialogue uh, based on the building of consensus, uh, but also responding to the country's developmental priorities while avoiding uh, disruptive labor confrontations. Right? So uh, the key objectives have always been to maintain high levels of an employment and a stable business environment that businesses can trust uh, and invest in. So this case study uh, will focus on the history and the role of the National Wages Council, NWC, uh, and how it, among other things, issues annual wage guidelines uh, that help employers, employees, and policymakers to come to consensus uh, about wages. Um, one thing to stress is that uh, tripartism is not unique to Singapore. Uh, it happens in many places. It's just that the strategy and mode of which negotiation differs. So this is Singapore's story, one wedded to our unique historical, developmental, and political context, not one that is easy to emulate, but nonetheless uh, offering lessons, I think, for all interested scholars and observers, as well as practitioners in the area of uh, which setting. In 1960, uh, the United Nations dispatched uh, a team to study and recommend an industrialization program uh, for Singapore. Right? They were not entirely optimistic because at the time, uh, very high local birth rates as well as migration from the Malayan Peninsula uh, led to very high rates of unemployment as well as underemployment in Singapore. So uh, we were told that there was a need to create at least 200,000 jobs uh, in the next 10 years. Right? So that was a huge task. Um, in 1961, the NTUC was of course set up. Um, and through uh, various measures, by the late 1960s, one of the key challenges uh, to uh, Singapore's economic development at the time, which was uh, labor unrest, uh, was largely brought under control. There, was a, there were several factors behind uh, this process. One was the close working relationship uh, described as symbiotic uh, by Mr. Lee Kuan Yew uh, between the NTUC and the People's Action Party that helped policymakers to understand uh, workers' and unionists' concerns. Another factor was uh, new employment and industrial relations legislation, such as the Industrial Relations Act of 1968, uh, that reduced the scope for collective bargaining, uh, while at the same time, the government also set up uh, platforms and processes that would cultivate support uh, for la uh, labour and wage policies, while reducing the need uh, for labour confrontation. Uh, that was the basis for the subsequent decades of industrial peace. The National Wages Council is, of course, at the heart of this story. 
since it was set up in 1972 as a tripartite organization to facilitate social dialogue. The NWC has representatives from the government, various departments uh, within the economic and labor ministries, employee representatives from the senior ranks of NTUC, as well as other major unions, and of course, employer representatives from the various business associations, trade associations, and chambers of commerce. A key feature of the NWC is, of course, uh, the neutral chairperson that, who can become uh, the fair arbiter right, in these negotiations. NWC's main job is to facilitate orderly wage adjustments um, by issuing annual wage adjustment guidelines. The key was to avoid strikes or long-drawn uh, wage negotiations while improving Singapore's economic competitiveness. The setting of these wage guidelines and the negotiations normally take several factors into consideration, um, such as uh, how to promote growth with equity, how to balance real wage increases against other economic considerations such as the cost of living, job creation, and productivity. The challenge for the various representatives on NWC is of course that they had to balance the interests of their respective constituents uh, while also remaining uh, focused on broader national interests. So key to this was the building of a reservoir of trust right, uh, that would facilitate and be in the interest of long-term problem solving. Right. Sometimes um, uh, the public may not be aware that the NWC's wage guidelines are technically speaking non-mandatory and not legally binding. Right? Um, the thinking behind this was that it would offer flexibility to employers as well as workers, um, um, but yet these wage guidelines also had a significant impact because of the way they were produced through a unanimity principle, which means that they are collectively endorsed by all three parties uh, giving it significant weight and social legitimacy. So while not technically legally binding, uh, it sets a tone for wage negotiations, it provides a starting point, and it spells out the principles to be used uh, in wage settlements for any particular year. Right. Um, NWC wage guidelines are also gazetted and made publicly uh, available. So while I say that they are not legally binding, um, they are often a starting point for mediators in the cases of which disagreements, and if disputes do reach the courts, uh, the judges will also take the wage guidelines into account. Maintaining economic competitiveness has been Singapore's, uh, one of Singapore's key priorities. As a small and open economy uh, that has to compete internationally for investments uh, as well as exporting most of our industrial output. Um, the recession in 1985 therefore was a serious challenge uh, that precipitated uh, huge cuts to wages. In that year, the, the NWC recommended wage adjustments um, in order to maintain cost competitiveness. Uh, and the experiences during that time also have shaped uh, current principles, uh, such as uh, wage adjustments uh, normally lagging behind labor productivity growth rates. This means that the NWC does not always recommend wage increases. Uh, in certain times, it will recommend wage restraint or even wage cuts. Uh, of course, during events, extraordinary events like economic shocks, recessions, and so on. The underlying thinking is that wage reductions are better than the loss of employment. Um, and in this way, if businesses can retain their experienced employees, um, they can pick up again quickly when the economy turns around. Right? So reducing wage costs in times of crisis uh, is a key principle on the understanding that uh, the gains will, of course, be shared again with employees uh, when times are better. This is the basis of the mutual trust uh, that I've already mentioned. Okay. 
One example of the kind of work uh, and flexibility that the NWC uh, has had to adopt uh, is in the area of quantitative versus qualitative wage guidelines. In the early years, in fact, from its founding in 1972 to 1985, the NWC historically adopted quantitative wage guidelines. These are numerical guidelines, for example, uh, X uh, percentage of wage increase, uh, or sometimes an absolute dollar, dollar amount. The advantage of doing this is clear. It's simple, it's direct, and it's precise. At other times, the NWC recommends a range from X percentage to Y percentage, giving employers and employees a bit more flexibility to negotiate actual rates. But following the 1985 recession, there was a push for more wage flexibility um, and the thinking that perhaps quantitative wage guidelines were too blunt to be applied to all sorts of companies and businesses. Right? So there was a switch uh, from that point onwards to qualitative wage guidelines that provide a common understanding of current economic conditions while providing employers and employees the latitude to set precise uh, wage adjustments. Then in, in 2012, there was yet another switch, uh, and NWC revived the practice of issuing quantitative wage guidelines, primarily targeted at low-wage employees. Um, the thinking behind this was that by prescribing precise increments for the lowest paid workers, it will help their wages to grow faster and gain ground with the median, uh, which has also been in recent years a major policy priority, right? to tackle the widening income inequality to do with competition uh, in certain sectors from uh, large numbers of migrant workers. So here is an example of uh, recent wage guidelines uh, targeting uh, lower wage workers. So combining a numerical uh, amount, a range sometimes, uh, but applying strictly to workers below a certain ceiling. Okay. Over the years, there have also been other important points in history where wage guidelines have played a prominent role. Um, I've already mentioned uh, the 1985 recession, um, where, the, where the NWC's uh, wage guidelines and recommendations played a key role in introducing more flexibility to Singapore's wage structure, uh, helping businesses to adjust their wage bills according to business conditions um, through specifically uh, a flexible wage system. This is a system where, uh, consisting of fixed components which will give employees some stability, but also with variable components that employers can use uh, to serve essentially as a shock absorber, to shrink their wage bills in challenging times, um, and then to compensate workers uh, fairly when things pick up again. Right? A second example is the 1997 Asian financial crisis, during which um, the Singapore dollar depreciated less against the US dollar than other regional currencies, making uh, the country's exports less competitive. So um, the government opted for cost-cutting measures to restore competitiveness. Right? At the same time, um, there was a cut to employers' contributions to the CPF from 20% to 10%, um, and NWC also recommended wage reductions. Um, Singapore emerged strongly from that recession uh, and recorded an uh, economic growth of 9% uh, by year 2000. In more recent times, uh, it was of course the COVID-19 pandemic that posed a serious economic challenge to Singapore, requiring uh, in certain circumstances uh, retrenchments and we also saw uh, the highest levels of unemployment in some years. So the NWC's recommendations initially was for companies to cut non-wage costs uh, and to tap on the government's wage offset schemes. And then in an unusual move, the NWC also issued supplementary guidelines uh, in near the end of 2020, urging employers to minimize retrenchments by imposing wage cuts if necessary, 
uh, and especially uh, for low-wage employees if their wages were cut to not go below $1,400. So um, this didn't last very long. Um, in October last year, 2021, uh, things had picked up, so the NWC called on employers whose businesses were doing well to restore the wage cuts uh, and even a wage increase of 4.5 to 7.5% of gross wages, uh, especially for low-wage employees. By charting the growth, uh, history, and contributions of the NWC, uh, we have seen how uh, it has performed a key role in Singapore's economic story through social dialogue, the building of trust, the issuing of annual wage guidelines, as well as a very flexible approach, best illustrated by its uh, 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 adapting uh, qualitative or quantitative guidelines depending on economic conditions. As Singapore's economic uh, environment continues to change and to adapt, uh, we can look forward, I'm sure, to the NWC evolving again. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Those are really insightful takeaways and uh, laying down key areas, you know, which really sets a stage, a good stage, for the first panel discussion that's coming right up. And it's featuring, really, this panel discussion, Unique and Intimate Reflections, Unique and Intimate Reflections by past National Wages Council Chairman. So for our first panel, we've invited two former National Wages Council Chairmen, Professor Lim chong Ya and Professor Lim Pin, to discuss how the unions, employers and government collaborated during the NWC's formative years to overcome thick and thin. May I invite up on stage, Professor Lim chong Ya, Founding Chairman, National Wages Council. And Professor Limpin, immediate past chairman, National Wages Council. A round of applause. And our moderator for this discussion is Professor Danny Kwa, Dean and Lee Cushing Professor in Economic, Economics, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Now, if we have questions for our panel members, please raise your hands later and we'll come with, to you with a microphone or come to the microphones at the aisle and ask your questions. Now, not right now, that's during the question and answer segment. And when you come to, when you are, put off your question, please do state your name and the organization you're coming from. Thank you very much. So over to you, Professor Kwa. Thank you. Um, and again, a warm welcome to everyone. Here to the Lee Kuan Yew School. Uh, thank you, Mr. Peter Sia Kok Ho, for so powerfully and evocatively setting the stage and the context for this case study that's being published, this very important piece of research that's been put together. Um, we have the wonderful opportunity to speak to these two amazing gentlemen who have been so critical and central in Singapore's journey on tripartism and the National Wages Council. I liked very much what, the, what was just said about we would get to have an intimate and personal conversation, reflections on this journey. So we're gonna keep it that way, intimate and personal, because there's a lot of other events here that we'll delve into some of the more technical features of this journey. Um, the reflections that we're going to go through will uh, come in this conversation from Prof Professors Lim chong -Ya and Professor Lim Pin. Lim chong -Ya, as you all know, is an economics professor, now emeritus, known to pretty much everybody involved in Singapore economics. He's founding chair of the National Wages Council. He served on it for over two decades. He's prominently featured in books and TV programs on leaders of Singapore and the few 
good men in Singapore who've taken the Singapore economic story forwards. Professor Lim Pin is NUS University professor, the highest academic title that our university can bestow. Professor of Medicine at NUS, and NUS's former vice chancellor, and of course also the immediate past chair of the National Wages Council. These reflections that we'd like to embark on, um, I'd like to begin perhaps by posing a question for each of you in turn, and maybe we'll proceed sequentially in the, in the, in the sequence of time that the, found, that the NWC itself took. So the, the question I'd like to ask to begin uh, touches on the start and the end of your NWC chairmanship journey. After that, we'll unpack other things, but we'll begin with the start and the end. How did you come to be appointed as NWC chair? So intimate and personal, remember. And what for you were the key lessons that you feel you got out of your time being chair? So the, the start and the end. I'm going to begin with Professor Lim Chong Ya. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you mind if we change the order? We, uh, we give the first speaker, the second chairman of the NWC, uh, the, the prerogatives and okay. opportunity to speak first. That, that's it's fine. Last to me because I'm a long winter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, but, but <laughs> Professor Lim Chong Ya, I have to warn you, I plan to be a strong moderator. <laughs> you still want me to be <laughs> We'll begin with Professor Lim Pin, and then after that, please. <laughs> Prius. <laughs> Professor Lim Pin, the start, how did you come to be appointed? What reflections you have from that time? And at the end of that journey, what key lessons you took away from that time? It's okay, working now. All right, okay. Right, I think um, Professor Lim Chong Ya set uh, the ball rolling, and I have to take the ball from him. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it rolling. No, basically, I think uh, uh, his time and my time were quite different. His time was a time of a lot of upheaval, a lot of fighting and uh, no sense of unity. People are fighting each other for their own personal, uh, personal, personal advances. And I think um, when it came to my time, I think there was a realization that the Singapore as a whole must proceed. Must proceed with people united. The one united people. And that is the overall philosophy that guides NWC. Both the unions and the employers and the government have the same interest to maintain a successful industrial policy. So that, I was looking at history, we have uh, no more strikes since 1978. That is a great achievement. That says a lot about how we manage our industrial relations. And this is important because Singapore can only develop by getting people to work together. Simple as that. We must get together to work together for a common good. We are too small to support each other. As the, Mr. Lee Cordy used to say, we are all in the small sampan. Don't rock the boat. All of us will go down together. So we cannot allow ourselves to fight among each other. We have to unite. Now, how do we get about to do this? I think Prof. Lim Chong Ya started the ball rolling, as I said, and that was the task, a big task we did, to get people to feel that there's an overall mission for all of us to achieve, to work together. Well, how do we work together? 
I think keeping in mind that we have all one common aim, that is to keep Singapore thriving and successful. She all went through a very tough time, as you know, in the early, in the early days of nationhood. We had to try to survive. Survival is the issue of life and death for everybody. And I think we have to be careful that unless we take care of ourselves, we all go down in the water together. So I think this is a very important point. So and the, both the union and the employers and the government know that we have to work as a team. It's a common objective. So when we have disagreement, let us try to assume um, uh, over this, this is a disagreement under this bigger picture, the bigger picture, national picture. So I think it's very important to remember this. That accounts of the fact that we have this issue of uh, ability to, to maintain a trust. See, one of the greatest features of NWC is trust between three parties. How, is the trust, how did the trust come about? It comes about very simply because we all share the common objective. We share a common objective that we have to work together so that we have to try to understand each other, to accommodate each other. And when I think negotiation takes place, it's not what you gain and what I gain, and what you gain and what I lose. It is how we solve a common problem. Every problem is a common problem for all three parties. Put our heads together and solve it together. That's how we come about to create the sense of togetherness. They are working together for a common cause. I think that's, that summarizes it all. I think there are a lot, a lot of things people will say about why can't other countries uh, come in and copy us? No, you can't, because they don't have the imperative, imperative that we have to face, imperative national survival. All right, when we left Malaysia, we were almost bankrupt. All right. How do I how to get business going? How do I attract industry? So, so the IWC evolved to what it is now, to trying to attract high value investment to create good jobs, to, en to ensure we are thriving economic uh, development. And furthermore, to be able to create an inclusive economy. Remember, inclusive economies are very important because if you have unequal distribution of goodies arising from all your effort, you will not get the, the mutual trust that we see in the NWC today. So I think maybe I better stop there for a while. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, among the very many interesting message in what you said, I took away three key words. Oh, it's my turn. Oh, may I comment <laughs> first? Yeah. Unity, trust, and imperative. And you emphasize on, the, on those three. And you know, as in setting you up for your, your intervention, Prof. Lim Chong Ya, um, I wanted to remark that what you said, Professor Lim Pin, also touches on sometimes how we too carelessly say tripartism is available to everybody else. It is available, and even when it's practiced elsewhere, it's not done in the same way that it's done in Singapore, where Singapore's singular success here is something really extremely distinctive. So building on that, Professor Lim Chong Ya, you started the ball rolling with the NWC. You were the one who got, was the founding chair, you got us all into this. So I'd like to hear your reflections on how you came into that job and what the key lessons you took away from that were. Yeah. A lot of questions the chairman asked, actually they are found in so many books I have written on the NWC. I like to carry a bag when I go to NWC meetings. And the back became heavier and heavier. And I remember, remember some members of the NWC protested. They say you should not allow the old professor 
At that time, I was 41. <laughs> to carry bags. Somebody should carry the bags. But since then, I still have the habit. I'll show you what are the books. I only bring four books, but there are much more, many more, on the NWC and numerous academic articles, okay? <laughs> and you read them. And if you don't fall asleep, uh, I think you should be getting a good class honors degree. <laughs> Some of them, they are written in, nah, you see, they are all here. Some of them, they are not on sale. You have to get them from the NWC Secretariat. But they are precious historical documents of this beloved country of ours. Now, I want to be a little frivolous. I will make two frivolous personal remarks. Do you know that I'm not only the oldest person in this group, I'm 91 octogenarian. Mm. 91. <laughs> but that is not all. I am the last student resident in this campus. I used to stay there. That was 72 years ago. <laughs> that was my residence. <laughs> I was a student. This is my alma mater. <laughs> One more point. Now, this is interesting. I'm glad that we can meet in this campus tripartite group. Although I don't see so many employers representative <laughs> except for the very distinguished gentleman over there. <laughs> Are there some employers representing you? Good. Excellent. <laughs> Are you how many trade union leaders? Put up your hand. <laughs> Excellent. I I ask trade union leaders because when I was appointed as chairman of NWC, we wanted to find a neutral place. At that time, neutrality was important. <coughs> At that time, tripartism, the union's identity was very strong. Confrontation with each group against the other, as Professor Lin Pin pointed out, was strong. The word mogo, Kong, strike were also frequently used, very common. So I asked the university administration, I'm looking for a neutral place to meet. I said, that can the university allow the first meeting of the NWC to be in, in, in this campus, in this place, Oi Chiang Hall is a very memorable hall, you know. So many of us all graduated from this campus. And the university, my university said, better not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we are worried what happened if the workers march with you. Too political problem, too political. Better find another place. As a good member of the staff, I must obey the administration decision. So I rang up Mr. Devonaya, who was the Secretary General of the NWC. Can you please find a place to have the first meeting? I hope the employers and the government side will not object. So I'm glad that 50 years later, we can just take for granted, we just come here and meet. <laughs> no yeah. Don't think it's noteworthy, but now we have got a place in 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 uh, Ministry of Manpower, huh? Mr. Ong Yen He, you must have engineered it to, to give the NWC a proper place to meet. Others have to meet from group to group, you know. And sometimes some members forgot they went to the other group. 
then I would like to congratulate the writer of this document on the historical evolution of the NWC. Why? Because there's one part which is often forgotten, missed, that is inflation. At the moment, as you know, Europe is in a kind of stagflation. And USA is a kind of stagflation with inflation as a main border and may also contribute to the fate of the Democrats. Now, inflation. We are having an inflation rate quite mild historically, about 6%, 5%. Historically, the benchmark used by the first chairman of the NWC is 4% and above. Watch out. Orange, or red. That applies not just to inflation, but to employment figure, not exceeding 4%. Inflation, not exceeding 4 that, What about balance of payments? It's important, you know. That will decide on our exchange rate. All right? And GDP, real GDP growth rate, that will affect our budget. Now, but the way it is, I'm not to give talk on this subject, okay? But what I want to tell you is this. The inflation rate at the moment is fairly mild, as it has to be attended to. And the causes of the inflation are, if it's nearly 50 years ago, that they are roughly similar. Cost push, maybe. Singapore is almost entirely cost push. A little demand pull <coughs> in the USA and in Europe. Remember that, and you know the kind of lesson they give, whether you can stop. Because it affects us. Ours is almost completely cost push. At that time, it was cost push, 1973. Do you know what was our inflation rate? 22%. 22%, okay, now it's only six. 22. What did the NWC do? Nothing. <laughs> because NWC did not know the chairman of the NWC thought it was not the duty of the NWC. It's the duty of the government. And the government, what did the government do? Oh, some, you read some of the books, they're all that. <laughs> <laughs> what did the government do? They all that. Including the starting of the cooperative. What's the name? Our beautiful retail cooperative. One of our best. Welcome. What? Welcome. Fair, what? Fair price. Well, welcome first. Welcome. Oh, welcome. Didn't do as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we changed it to fair price. Is it called fair price? Yes. Fair price. Fair price. It was started then. Do you know that a lot of members of the NWC, uh, 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 of the NTUC, including our ambassador, I remember Professor Montero was our ambassador to USA. He told me when I went to USA, 
He said, you know, I just come back from Louisiana because the U.S. Embassy told me that you will be here. I come back. I said, what do you do in Louisiana? I got the instruction to buy up whatever rice I could from USA. Our we, uh, rice shortage. And another man from NTUC, he, Devon Nair, Mr. Devon Nair told him, you better go to go and get more rice. What is his name? Huh? He is the pro chancellor of the NTU. A Singaporean with an Indian name. Sorry, I don't want to be racist. <laughs> he went together with others to where, you know, to Dave Bangladesh to buy rice. I use all these as examples to illustrate the seriousness of the situation. Of course, the government also raised, as we do now, our exchange rate. At that time, we have already moved into an exchange rate system. The government to rightly remove the tax rate, payroll tax. When we were in Malaysia, the Malaysian government had a payroll tax, so we too had a payroll tax, and the government removed. Prof. Lim Chong, yeah, can I? Prof Lim, can I, can, I, can I pause you on this? Because this is a really critical point. Yeah. Um, the, you know, as you go through our history, the economic history and the history of, of uh, our wondering. international relations, but I thought I wanted to, to get you and Prof Lim Pin to come back to reflect on the role of NW, uh, NWC in yeah, all of I'm this in particular. I'm going to the NWC now. <laughs> because it, it's quite... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. What do I do? I said 1973, NWC role was not as growth with equity. That mm. means inclusive role, growth, mm. good growth today, jargon. Mm. That means growth with equity, but the inflation was unexpected. And it was caused by high oil prices and food prices. Mm. In 1973, it was mainly food prices. 1974, oil prices came in. End of 1973, oil price went up by 400 times. And now oil price goes up by 10%, 20%, 40%, you know. At that time, 400%. Inflation rate, month to month basis, 32, 33%, month to month. Almost challenging the inflation rate of Sri Lanka today and Pakistan. They have 80% inflation rate, both these countries. So we were very serious, you know. Were you here, there? Mr. Ong Yen Hur, <laughs> you are too young. It's good to listen to some old people. How many of you were there when we were fighting the inflation? The government, I don't know why. They just say that inflation let NWC handle. Okay, so we're going to let... Even use the word, let Professor Lim Chong Yah handle. Right, so, so this is getting to where we want to hear the story now. So what, what, what did you do? What did you as NWC do in the face of these geopolitical large challenges? How did NWC handle this? No. It's all in the book. <laughs> There's one book, I'll be digressing. It's not here. It's by a person called Rosalind Chu. 
Professor Chu Sun Beng's wife. And I mentioned that book on NWC because for two reasons. First, it was published by ILO. So or the ILO was circulated throughout the world on NWC. Two, the Korean government translated it into Korean so that the Korean would be able to understand and follow Singapore. They did follow Singapore. I was their advisor. That is a separate story. <laughs> many governments, not just Korean, you know, many. Now we come back to this. What did NWC do? The chairman of NWC recommended a $40 plus 6% increase net. In other words, you were all not who were in the negotiating body at that time. <laughs> Put up your hand, please. I don't want to think I am the only person left. <laughs> it is true. I am the only person left. <laughs> because some time ago, the, the Ministry of Manpower Secretariat organized a big dinner. And they did some stands, you know. And they also used to have a credit card. I still have the credit card. Souvenir. And the picture of the first meeting of the NWC. I look at the picture. So all my colleagues have gone before me. <laughs> From the government side, I can still remember with fondness, with gratitude, with admiration for the spirit of tripartism working together with me. Mr. George Bogart, who was head of the civil service. Mr. <coughs> Kwa Sun Chuan, permanent secretary of the Ministry of Manpower, Labor at that time. Mr. P. Y. Huang, or I P. Y. Huang, director of the EDD. At that time, only three. There are reasons why only small. On the trade union side, of course, will be Mr. Devonire, the most dynamic, nationalistic, the ablest of the trade union leaders. Number two, my Oh, beloved professional friend, Professor Tom Elliot. How many of you know Professor Tom Elliot? You see? Tom Elliot, poor Tom. He came from Northumberland. If today you see a policeman, he looks like one of us, and his name is Elliot. Please remember, he is Professor Tom Elliot's son. He adopted, he adopted a few of our Singaporean children. Professor Tom Elliot was representing NTUC together with George Bogas. Another person I will not name. I'll leave it to you to guess. <laughs> for good reasons, why I will not name. And then, government, employer side. Professor Stephen Lee, Dr. Mr. Stephen Lee, are you here? He used to come later. His <laughs> beloved, very able, capable father, Richard Lee, he was the founder NWC, he represented the employers. He ran a Malaysian textile mill in Jurong. 
Professor Chong Yeah, can I pause you here? Yeah. I want to I want to bring Professor Lim Pin in on this because you've just described for us some of the critical things we need to remember about the world going forwards with inflation and economic crisis. And, and that's a wonderful, wonderful story. Okay, Professor, Professor Lim Pin, you also had to deal with a different crisis, which was the SARS crisis in 2003, which also reminds us of the COVID pandemic that we're just coming out of now. And of course, economic policy, wages policy mattered too as well. I wonder if I could get you to say a few words reflecting on that time and lessons from here. The high inflationary policy, if we think it, it was victorious. We were praised for the entire world. How did we do it? We could only do it because we stay united. Employers all agreed to pay. <laughs> and the compliance rate at that time was very, very high. And we did use, as Professor Lim said, we, Three of us, three groups were very united. We saw. And I remember using this poem to help to get the unity of the three groups. When things go bad, we have to all stay together and fight together. Lao Tan Dalam, Saman, but Sama Burundam. Perkara yang susah menjadi senang. Marilah kita bersatu hati. Perkara yang susah menjadi senang. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Lim Pin, Professor Lim Chong Yeo touched on some of these th same themes about unity, trust, working together. And I wanted to get you to reflect on a particular incident that also draws on your medical expertise, uh, the different pandemics that we had experienced early on and what we've just come through now, and how you see something like NWC playing a role in this. I think uh, Prof. Lim Chong has given us a very entertaining session, <laughs> which, which I think you enjoy. And um, I think it's very difficult to be serious after this. <laughs> <laughs> But I do want to, to share one thought, uh, not being in NWC now, and that's that uh, the word trust is a key fundamental operating word in NWC, trust between three partners of NWC. And this trust, I believe, is so precious and this trust is what makes NWC unique. No other country can try to replicate NWC because it do not share the same degree of trust among the three partners. Now, this trust, as I look at it from the long-term uh, perspective, trust is something which has to be built and strengthened all the time. It cannot be there, you know, it expect to be there all the time. I think the practitioners of the three parties must continue to build on it. The trust must be continue to be strengthened by action. For example, I'll give you an example. During hard times, we have to cut down, enjoy, cut, cut down jobs and, 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 and to, save, to save the company. But I think in good times, the understanding is that you do this, when times are good, the employers should pay back, should return the goodwill, should appreciate the contributions. And this is what we call trust. Trust has to be continually strengthened and built. It doesn't, it doesn't exist there forever, and it has to be all remember that we must continue to build this trust by our behavior, by consistency, by our sense of commitment to be honest to the partners and play the game for long term and not for the immediate gain and short term gain. Trust has to be built up all the time. This is very, it's very important, particularly from a point of view, two aspects. One is employers promise to share gains 
You tell them, you tell the, 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 the employees, you, we, we suffer now, these bad times, we cut, cut, cut down on salaries and, and things like that. But the employer should say, I will pay back, I will give you back when times are good. And this must be, must be adhered to and, 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 and properly adhered to and not just words of, words of birth. And in other words, in other words, implement what you promise. You must promise, do what you promise. And this is very important to keep the trust. The trust must be continually built and strengthened. That's my last message to the NWC. Because the trust is what makes us different. No other countries can duplicate an NWC because they do not have the trust that we have among three parties. And that is uh, the key to success of NWC. Build trust, continue to strengthen it. That's my last message for NWC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you. I want to draw some, you know, just one quick general lesson about how, as we've been warned, this is not a model that necessarily transports easily to other nations. Trust, unity, the imperative. But we might also think about how, if we are worried about whether this model transports to other countries, we might also put some thought into how this model transports to the future. Because the future is also a different country, and we need to be constantly vig vigilant about how to keep the lessons, the positive lessons from NWC going forwards. I think you'll agree with me, this has been valuable insights that we've gotten from these two grand gentlemen. I urge you to join me in a round of applause in concluding this session. Thank you very much, professors. It's been a very good, very good dialogue. Once again, a, a warm round of applause for our, our panelists, our moderator. Really bringing forth the, the, the heartbeat, I think. I really say the heartbeat, the war stories, the heart to heart, right? Lessons that we can take, not just from the past to the present, but from the past and present into our shared future that we have to continue to shape together. So please remain on stage. We're going to take a group photo first with our. Uh, it's, it's, it's such, a, such a rare opportunity, really, to have former and current National Wages Council chairman in the same room. So they're going to remain on stage for a group photo. And I'd like to invite Mr. Peter Sia. Mr. Peter Sia, I'm on stage. A Tripartite Collective Advisor, Ms. Diana Chia, up on stage. As well as Permanent Secretary of Development, Minister of Manpower, Mr. Chia Dejun, up on stage as well. We're going to take a group photo right here. Just come Okay. Okay, let's smile.
Thank you very much. Once again, a round of applause for our chairman and partners. We proceed now back down stage. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time now for a short break before we continue the second half of this program today. So we can help ourselves to the refreshments that we prepared for us right outside this hall. And in the spirit of tripartism, really, let's come together, make some stronger friendships and connections with the rest of the people in the hall as well. It's the time now is about 3.50 and we will come back here, resume the second part of this program at 4.10 p.m. 4.10 p.m. So see us back here. Okay, welcome back to the Tripartite Collective Dialogue. Now, I hope we've enjoyed our tea break, our break time, and made new connections and friendships. And now, let's go. we're going to jump right in into the second half of today's program. Now, the National Wages Council traditionally looks at wage setting principles and models, such as productivity vis-a-vis -vis wage increase, whether it's lag or precede, quantum instead of percentage increase for low-wage workers, and also flexible wage system. But with the changing employment landscape and workforce profile, there will be new challenges to wage setting and negotiation. So with that, how, how do tripartism values help government, employers and employees to better prepare themselves for these challenges? Our second panel for this afternoon will look into the, the journey towards fair and effective wage policies and seek to provide some insights on how the NWC can and should continue to remain relevant. May I now invite up on stage Mr. Peter Xia, Chairman, National Wages Council, Ms. Cham Hui Fong, Deputy Secretary General, National Trades Union Congress, Mr. Ong Yen He, former Divisional Director, Labor Relations and Workplaces Division, Ministry of Manpower, and Ms. Mr. Alexander Melchers, Vice President, Singapore National Employers. Federation. And our moderator for this discussion is Associate Professor Terence Ho from, from the Lee Kuan Yew Park School of Public Policy. Now, if we have questions, please feel free to raise your hands. We'll come to you at the, at the question and answer segment with a microphone. If not, you can proceed to the microphones at the aisle. So right now, over to you, Professor Ho. Very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you all agree that um, panel one was a very difficult act to follow. It was so insightful and interesting. <laughs> but I'm still very much looking forward to this uh, session we have, panel discussion two. We have four very distinguished um, panelists with many years of experience among them in the National Wages Council. They are Mr. Peter Sia, NWC Chairman, uh, Ms. Cham Hui Fong, Deputy Secretary General, NTUC, and also an NWC member from 2005 to 2018, Mr. Ong Yen He, a veteran from the Ministry of Manpower, former Divisional Director of Labor Relations and Workplace Division, and also an NWC member representing, I understand, NTUC from 1981 to 84, and Mr. Alexander Melkus, a long-time SNEF Vice President, as well as NWC member from year 2000 to present. So, um, to kick off this discussion, I thought I would start by asking Mr. Peter Sia to um, start off by telling us what are the different roles that he sees the different uh, tripartite partners play in determining the national priorities and wage setting policies, and also how do you see the NWC wage guidelines helping to support national objectives? Well, I think bottom line is the members representing the tripartite partners clearly need to support their own constituents. So that must be an accepted principle. And how you then uh, allow the three parties to navigate uh, in their discussions to come up with a, a common uh, set of guidelines that is acceptable to all I think there is a lot of give and take uh, among the constituents. Uh, it's really built on what uh, Prof Lim Pin has stated over and over again. It's a trust that has been built over, I would say, by now 50 years. A trust that there is a common purpose 
there's a common uh, interest to ensure that the country progresses and that there's a balance between the interests of all three parties to achieve that. So it, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing and, 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 and actually when I listen to uh, Prof. Uh, Lim Chong Yeh about uh, the, the founding years, uh, it's quite different. Between the two Prof. Lim's, they have built up this strong foundation of trust uh, that makes my role as chairman actually quite easy because there's so much trust that uh, the negotiations are usually very smooth and I don't remember having any real confrontation among the members about uh, any issues. So while we emphasize trust as well, I think you've brought out a key, another key point, the balance among parties in order to achieve the win-win-win outcomes. So let me turn now to the other panelists. And maybe you can start from um, Ms. Chung. Um, and let's talk about what are some of the principles you think of uh, wage policies that have been critical for the NWC's work and whether you see some of these uh, principles. I think they were referred to as well in uh, Dr. Ng's presentation earlier, um, the first session uh, earlier as well, on principles such as wages um, lagging behind uh, productivity growth and having this link between wages and productivity growth. But what other principles do you think are relevant um, to the NWC's work in the past and maybe perhaps are they still relevant going forward? Uh, thanks very much. Um, as far as I remember, um, it has always been um, allowing the businesses to stay competitive. Um, I, I guess, um, I guess for, for the tripartite partners to be able to um, remain coherent, uh, cohesive, uh, sorry, should not be coherent, cohesive, all this while is that um, there is a common belief. There's a common belief that we want the companies to thrive. And, but at the same time, when the companies thrive, companies must be fair to the workers. That you have to pay reasonable and fair wages to the, our workers. I think it's with that key principles uh, that we move into NWC negotiations. So if we need companies to be competitive, um, and therefore we have to look at what would be the right measures to, to guide the NWC negotiations. Hence, um, all this while, um, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, it has been qualitative when I was, when I was with NWC, it was already qualitative. Uh, quantitative was only probably, uh, probably 10 years ago. But the key principle is always um, that we must pay reasonable wages, but workers have got to be productive. I think it is, um, it, is, it is quite unusual for the unions in Singapore to be pushing for productivity. And, uh, and we have never lacked, I mean, it's, it's, one, it's one key guide that we have been pushing for. So, and, but it's also interesting to note how it has actually evolved. Um, during the earlier days, it was um, lagging behind productivity. I remember that there were times we were arguing over lag behind, and we have some who commented that the English is not correct because lag is already behind. You don't use lag behind, so it's lag productivity. So we, even, even in the drafting committee, we move, go into some of those narratives. Um, but productivity used to hover around 7-8%, 9-10% during the earlier times. But when the economy start to mature, one, we notice that GDP will probably be good at 3 to 4%. And the productivity ups and down, uh, three, probably uh, around that region, but of course there are times where it, it has come down. And we tend to use the average last few years because it may not be very uh, practical to just use the, the year before the previous year, the preceding year, uh, and therefore determine what should be the next years. So we use, tend to use a moving average of the last three years or last, last five years. I think there are times we all know that we cheated, right? The last five years, if it's not too good, we use last seven years. There's actually no much basis. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, there were, I mean, we, we just need to just justify because we know that the whole labour market, because we have to also look at the labour market, the tightness of the labour market. If the labour market is very tight, it doesn't make sense for us to recommend something that is just 2% just because productivity is 2.5%. So, so we have to take a look at how the whole economy is progressing and of course, hoping that the company can push a lot more in terms of innovation, in terms of innovation uh, productivity-driven kind of technology advancement. 
So, so then over the past few years, we use uh, productivity to grow in tandem. So, so I think what is most key to us is really productivity to grow in tandem with um, uh, wage increases, to be fair. If the workers put in fair amount of work to arrive at those productivity levels, I think we have to be fair to them. Um, of course, there are, there are some, some other measures that we look at is really inflation. Um, we, also, we often ask ourselves, should we index wage increase to inflation? Uh, that's, that's actually a perennial request put forth by our leaders. I think my CC members are here uh, who, can, who, who can attest that it was not easy to convince our, our leadership that despite productivity growing at 10 12%, I mean, fortunately, we didn't quite have those experience, but we do have some years when it was pretty high. 6 7% was already very high because uh, if you look at the records, our wage increases for the last few years hovers around 4 to 5%. And in some cases, some years, 3 to 4%. So when inflation hits uh, 4%, uh, the smartest thing we did was MTI introduced a call inflation. Uh, you were from MTI also, right? Were you? So, so we used to call just the headline inflation. Okay, headline inflation, everybody understand. Uh, then I think it was probably more than 10 years ago, then we start to introduce call inflation. And we have to go down to the ground to explain what is call inflation. Basically, it's call infl uh, inflation minus the accommodation plus the private transport. Um, but, but I think... What I'm saying this is um, the, 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 a lot of concerns on the ground is if my wage increases is going to be 4%, but the inflation this year may be going to be 7%, 8%, um, I'm as good as not getting any real wage increase. And hence, there is a lot of pressure on us to move into the quantitative guidelines again. Um, um, but I think having said that, <coughs> um, our, our explanation, our justification to our leadership has always been... Um, there are years when inflation is high. We just hope that it will not continue to grow. But when it moves into a stagflation or negative, are we expecting to have no wage increases? Or, I mean, uh, it's ridiculous to say I pay back or I claw back, allow the companies to claw back. So, so, so many a times it has to be based on very rational uh, discussion, I mean, proposals, not just for the current year itself, but moving forward, how would the whole data trends move? Uh, how would it affect the whole negotiation? So it's with all those principles in mind, as in, we, we, it's not, it's, we want the whole economy to be an ongoing concern. It's not just here to survive for 2022 and that's it. Because we have to really look short term and long term. And therefore, the discussion honestly just hovers around these two. And I think it has been very useful to actually guide us through all these years. Champ for sharing with us some of the key guiding principles the need to achieve reasonable wages along with productivity and also taking into consideration inflation. I think you've also shared with us some uh, technical details which are very useful, granular insights, and some of the nuances of language even. So now may I invite Mr. Malkus to also weigh in, please. Thank you. Um, firstly, obviously, I'm very humbled to be invited on this panel here. Um, I had the uh, privilege to already be in the National Wages Council under you, Professor Lim chong -Yah. Um So I learned a lot during these um, years, and I also experienced um, um, significant changes. Um, this word trust has been used a lot. I can only confirm that, but I want to add that it's actually not trust between parties, um, but trust on multi-levels between actually individuals and um, people who act and people who do things. This trust and tripartite is not something that is enshrined in a law or in a rule or that there are certain conditions of engagements or that there's enforcement. It's all about the individuals who are part of it to act um, and to support this trust. And um, that involves companies and, and the unions, but um, even HR practitioners on the ground. Um, small mistakes can have large impacts. Um, I think two years ago, um, we were very close to a strike. Um, at one of the aviation companies um, here in Singapore. Uh, many people in Singapore were surprised because they think strikes are actually forbidden. Um, I had a, um, um, a session with civil servants a while back and asked them in the panel, um, um, do you think strike is allowed in Singapore or forbidden? And more than half actually thought that strike was forbidden by law in Singapore. The, yeah, yeah, here in Singapore it was at the civil service college. Um, and um, so strike is very loud. It, there are good um, measures built in to avoid a strike, um, but as an ultimate means um, um, in the negotiation, strike is allowed. I think it's very important that we never forget this and that we are aware about it. And therefore, Professor Limpin, I, I share your celebration that we didn't have a strike. It's a great, um, a, a fantastic achievement. Um, the, um, on the principles um, that you have asked for, um, to um, add a little bit on what Hui Fong has said, Sister Hui Fong, 
you know, where can an Angmo call somebody like <laughs> Wei Feng, a sister? Come on, you know. Um, um, I, I would like to add two challenges and uh, the, the concept of the flexibility um, of these um, um, wage um, and discussions and negotiations um, because the flexibilities for me are on two levels. The first one is um, the responsiveness um, so that we are able to respond to crisis and to good times. Again, that requires the trust that um, in, in bad times people tighten their belts and in good times um, gains are also shared. Um, but the other level of flexi um, the flexibility also that we need to consider is the, the very sectoral diversity of our industries um, that we operate in, and we are trying to have a national wages recommendation for industries um, which operate under complete different, sometimes even conflicting economic um, parameters, very local industries like construction, um, who don't compete internationally but are under cost pressure here on the ground or space pressure and so on, um, who are basically also performing poor in terms of productivity, and then international um, and manufacturing entities who come from, um, from abroad, bring factories here, and have to compete internationally. Um, so their, their operating modes are completely different. Their view on productivity and their pressure is completely different. And um, in our elaborations, we were always able to come up with recommendations that are flexible enough to cater for all these industries and to be then adaptable. Because at the end, legitimization of our work is how many companies actually adopt our recommendations, how many companies follow us, which is not easy because many MNCs have their own salary structures, their own rhythms, um, their own um, concepts. Many of them are actually ahead of our recommendations, both in terms of quantums and quality. And so we have to pick up everybody. And I think that's the main challenge that we are facing. And um, um, I think every, all the tripartite partners are committed to it, but for sure we cannot take for granted that it will work just because we say so. Sharing, um, you know, uh, helping us to appreciate how precious that trust is, and also helping to unpack it for us. And I think the point you brought up, um, you know, the diversity of the different uh, business conditions, may, and and therefore the importance of flexibility to make sure that the guidelines can apply um, well to all. I think those are really key points that we take on board. Now, may I invite uh, Mr. Ong? Well, since uh, I was with the NTUC for, I think, five years. I represented NTUC at the NWC. And when I went back to the Ministry of Manpower, I represented for more than 20 years. That's why I served under Professor Lim and Professor Lim Pin. Now, uh, I would like to make two observations on the role of NWC. I thought it's relevant for union and management and also for the government. One observation is that before NWC was set up, <coughs> uh, the rule of the game at that time was for employer, it's a zero-sum game. The more, you, the more I give it in, in to you on, on your demand, what you need demand, it's like less I get it. And I won't share information with you, common. You know. And to the union, it's as much as I can, I squeeze out from the employer. I don't care whether you're profitable or not. And then because if I get more for, from the employer, I'll get support, strong support from, from a member and I get elected. So that was the rule of the game, no sharing information, no common reference point, very important. No common reference point in terms of wage negotiation. Okay, now, with the setting our NWC, tripartite party come together. They engage with each other, they consult, they negotiate, you know. Uh, but in the process, they develop this issue of give and take, and also, I mean, in a way, also, uh, confidence and, and trust that we're talking about. Now, because three parties were involved in the discussion, in the formulation of guidelines, you are committed to it. Because for the constituents of each partners, whether it's from the union or from the employer or even the government, you are committed because your apex body were represented and you are consulted in the process. Because of that, the NWC guideline, once it gets set, become a common reference point. Now, once you're a common reference point, the rule of the game has changed. The rule has changed again. In the past, there was no reference point. In the past, there was no trust. There was no sharing information. Now, you do have a reference point. So, in the past, I would describe them as you're part of the problem of industrial relations. They say a lot of dispute, a lot of confrontation, eventually to strikes and so on. But now, with NWC guidelines, 
is a common reference point, you're part of the solution. You're part of the solution because your apex body has actually agreed and you've con been consulted. So therefore, it's easier for implementation. Now, even for a third party, as the government is a neutral party, conciliator, for instance, these people that cannot be resolved on NWC guidelines <coughs> come to the ministry. The ministry also use the Bible, the, the, rec, uh, the guideline, because the ministry also committed to the acceptance of the guideline. It is easier for implementation. Even if we don't settle at the Ministry of Manpower, you go to arbitration court. The arbitration court also make reference to it. So therefore, you have a system whereby, you know, the part of the problem now become part of the solution. And not only that, you also had the procedures to resolve differences when the dispute arises. In the past, the ministry also had problem because even if you cannot resolve, no reference point. You come to the ministry, we are technocrats. How do you get a reference point? It becomes, that's why the ministry is something of being accused of 50% men. You know, you come to the ministry, you just cut half, okay, then try to solve it. So therefore, I would say that the NWCs really, in a way, have given rise to tripartism, strong tripartism, because first, the, the forum for the engagement. In the past, there was no common forum for engagement. Yeah, engagement. Secondly, it's also you had a quorum for, in a way, express your concern. Now, once you express your concern, the other party hear you, and they slowly they will also appreciate your, 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 your problems and so on. That's why compromise can easily come along. I also want to add that leadership in the respective tripartite partner is also very important. You know, Apex Body, you have to command the respect and acceptance of different chambers of commerce, the local, the foreigners, and so on. And people like Stephen D, for instance, I give real respect, honesty, been able to command the respect, including the Amoa, is not very easy. <laughs> you know, Amoa typically may not accept this one. So I think it's very important. It's a special Amoa anyway, no? <laughs> for the union, the NTUC got to command, you know, with acceptance and the respect of their respective sectorial union leaders, from the public sector, from the private sector, so on. So therefore, I would, that for the government also, don't play a role of facilitators. I think this question, I think, uh, will probably ask, what's the role of government? I think the government provides a lot of common, I would say, statistics and data. GDP from MTI, which increases from MT, uh, MOM and so on, and also other statistics. Now, in the past, I mean, if you give me a bit of time, I can share with you. In the past, when it started, I remember when I represent NTUC, Employer will come up with their statistics. The first session of NWC, typically employer come up with a survey, 50 company, you know. And then typically they probably target it. And those are what the SME, you know. It's not so good, you know. This is our which, you know, wages actually problem, you know. It's a it's business is not so good. The union will come up with those early setter, earlier setter. They pick out maybe 30 company that early setter with them. They say, look, which increases very high. So therefore, this year recommendation must be high. All right. So the government's role is that, well, not too bad, but at the same time also not too bad, not too, too good. So this is a government's role. And government, not only that, I would say that government also take into account of the entire society, the economy as a whole. So I would really say that uh, the setting out at NWC is really paved the way for the transformation from uh, union and management being part of the problem, become part of the solution. You know, and also rule of the game has changed. And changed for the better, because with this process of, of formulation of guideline, with input from the tripartite partners, and give and take the spirit of give and take, eventually come with something consensus. That's why we are able to, because of the trust, because of the ability to work together through the NWC, we capitalize on it. Because I remember 1985, we had a recession. 86, there was a formation of tripartite committee. Uh, by NPI, and we were, and there was also a committee by the NWC on which they formed, which I was part of it, I think Stephen also part of it, Dim Boon Hing, I remember. And uh, we came up with uh, the recommendation to transform the wages. It, at that time, the wage system was very entrenched with seniority base. The longer you serve the company, the higher the salary. You know, and you can't really adjust the wage downward in bad time. In the 1985, the session taught us a lesson. They will need to move to a more flexible wage system. That's why the wage reform was recommended. And uh, 
Today, I would say that, of course, there's subsequent, there's also another round of wage uh, restructuring. Today, uh, Singapore, we have the flexible wage system in general. Most companies have performance-based link, which increase, uh, I mean, wage system. And it's very important because the flexibility is there. When the company faces recession, business downturn, they can make adjustments very quickly, very, very quickly. And let help the workers to save jobs. I mean, you, you look at our recent recessions and so on, a difficulty. The number of workers being retrenched, much less, much less. Because you can make good use of the flexible wage system to retain workers. I must also say here that, that not the, just uh, try to sell a career for government, really. The government should play a very important role. The important role being that, like, for instance, in the last recession, 2008, 2009, uh, the government come up with training grant, enhance the training grant. And that's important because uh, I remember that when I tried to cope with recession at that time, Mr. Lim Sui Se represented NTUC, uh, seven uh, SNEF and the ministry side. And the slogan at that time was that we must cut costs to save jobs, not to cut jobs to save costs. I thought it was a very powerful slogan. And Mr. Lim Sui Se really, I mean, he's very good in this. It's a big, big difference. It urge people, each employers and unions, so let us cut job, not to cut cost for and to save job, rather than cut job to save cost. An entirely different perspective. And the government come up with say we enhance the training grant. They become more credible for the government to be part of the solution. You see? That's why I personally think that uh, the because of the NWCs providing a, a platform for the three parties to consult each other, from there they negotiate, they build up trust, and so on. Now, the second example on the use, apart from coping with a crisis, the, the, the tripartite party that cut costs to save jobs, we are so impressed by the ILO. The ILO, when they attended the annual ILO conference, the three leaders were invited to share with the other ministers all over the world. Stephen Day was there, I think Mr. Minister Gan King Yong was there, and Sim Ji Se. They share how Singapore helped you know, in a way, bring together the three parties together to cope with crisis. Uh, so one is that cut costs to save jobs. Is a cut job to save costs? The government will come up with this one. They were very impressed. I think ILO is, is a big UN organization inviting our team to share our experiences. It's something, you know. And now, second example I want to also mention is that apart from changing our wage system from seniority-based system to a performance based and more flexible wage system. The second one really is uh, raising the retirement age. <clears throat> we may take for granted that, oh, we raise the retirement age so smoothly. Before 1993, <clears throat> when we introduced the retirement age law, before 1993, our retirement age norm was not, oh, 55. At 55, a lot of HR managers will open the drawer, take out the standard retirement letter to say, Look, thank you very much for your service. 20, at 55. At that time, the CPL withdrawal was also 55, right? You just imagine that 55 and today, our retirement norm is 68, it's going to be 70. Now, why we were able to do that without demonstration? And so in other countries, when you raise the retirement age, there were demonstration because pensions are affected and things like this. In our case, hardly any dispute because a lot of consultation among the tripartite partner. We formed successive committee, I, I was involved in many of this one. Now, we started uh, from 55 eventually to 60, to 60, then 62. Then 62, we, after that, we go into re-employment. We went to Japan to study re and reform was 60 to 65. And today, is 68, you're 67, 68, you're gonna be 70. Now, you look at this one, from 55 to 68, 13 cohorts of experienced people in the workforce. Instead of, you know, at 55, you need to be retired, and what are you going to do at 55? They probably go to a white deck in HDB. What do they do? Talk back about the government, maybe, criticize. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very important, if you not see the significance of the NW's contribution that, in a way, bring about tripartite partnership. And we were able to do that because the three parties were able to in a way, engage each other to raise the retirement age 
and also give and take to the employer, they want flexibility. To the union, they want an opportunity for workers to be re-employed, to be, I mean, to be continue to employ, earn a regular income and save more for, for retirement. So I thought it's a very, very important uh, development because of the setting of NWC as a platform for tripartite engagement. Of course, there are many other examples I can give you, like bus contracting system. Our bus contracting system from the old system to the new one. They also form a tripartite committee. I remember it chaired by Josephine Thio at that time, yeah, minister, so on. And they came up with the, all the measures, including the union. The union was included, uh, invited, and they were able to formulate very good arrangement whereby unions and workers and uh, concern were addressed. And today, they implemented very smoothly. So, of course, PWM, we have so many pre-WM. Uh, also, my sense is too many, uh, but I think you have to very consolidate. <laughs> I think I better stop here, but what I wanted to, to share with you is that because of the NWC, we have actually, in a way, changed the rule of the game uh, from fighting to working together, and also that become part of a prop, from a prop, prop, part of a problem become part of a solution. And then with that, we also develop tripartite collaboration, and then from there, of course, it helped to solve many other problems, coping with economic crisis, raising the retirement age, changing the uh, wage structure from what they call seniority-based to a flexible and performance-based, and also many other areas. I will stop here. I think that shouldn't take too much of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ong. I think you're sharing about how the rules of the game have been changed. Uh, pre- and post-NWC really sh sh highlights and shines the spotlight on the significance of the NWC. And also, um, thanks for sharing about the critical role played by the government as, a, in a sense, a neutral or trusted arbiter. And also how these uh, mechanisms and instincts that NWC helped to forge are applicable in so many other important areas in the labour market, such as retirement age, bus contracting, and the progressive wage model. At this point, I think some of you um, in the audience may have some questions for the panellists. So I'd like to take the opportunity to invite anyone. Please um, introduce yourself and direct your questions to any one of the panellists. Anyone would like to get the ball rolling? Mm -hmm. Skip the first question, go to the second question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought maybe while um, all of you continue to think about what you would like to ask, I could ask maybe, um, maybe starting with Mr. Sia, on how you view the challenges and experiences of trying to align uh, different interests, and then subsequently I think the panel members can share that within your various um, constituencies, so to speak, how you manage to obtain internal stakeholder support for the positions. As I said, the, the foundation of trust is very key to the solutions. But perhaps a demonstration of how the tripartite partners came together uh, to address a very difficult period was probably the COVID pandemic. Uh, the country experienced its worst possible downturn. Uh, very difficult decisions had to be taken uh, to address costs, uh, employment, and it was difficult for the two different constituents to come together and say, what's the <coughs> balanced solution that will enable employers and companies to carry on doing business and minimize the pain that employees have to take. And at the same time, not forgetting the low wage workers. So I thought it was, but the way it was crafted uh, was not only to make a call and to give broad guidelines about companies that are doing well, those that are not, uh, those that uh, cannot afford, but at the same time, a call was made to remind all parties when the economy recovers, don't forget those who make the sacrifices. And I think this, this very strong agreement between particularly between employers and employees, were very important foundations. So if you look at the recommendations, the next set is coming up soon, 
there is a general call, you know, to ensure that that every party remembers that the other party had to make sacrifices. And basic basic principle is that everybody should do well when the economy recovers. Uh, and I also see that the role of the NWC has evolved to not just address addressing uh, wages and so on, but to, ad to help address how our economy needs to be reshaped to retain employment, to keep Singapore competitive. And so if you look at the last few years, there's been a very strong call for upskilling, reskilling, and also a call to make use of government grants and subsidies that are available for training. Uh, a call also has been made to the constituents outside of the council, our trade association chambers and so on, to help push through the recommendations and guidelines. The NWC is not a regulatory body, so it, it, it actually has got to persuade the constituents to adopt as much of these guidelines as possible. So we, for example, track very closely, uh, originally a very weak implementation of payments for low-wage workers to hopefully bring it up. <clears throat> so the social aspect of it is, of course, to reduce the wage gap, gap in Singapore and not to leave behind certain segments of our society. So I see an evolving role, uh, but what I've seen over the years is this strong willingness to work together to forge policies and always keeping in mind that what's best for the economy, what's best for the country should be the long-term objective. And so trade-offs are always on the table and I see the different parties willing to make those trade-offs. I would so, yeah, for these uh, insights. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Marcus. I would like to um, to add on that. Um, I think the real test of um, tripartite NWC, we will not look back at COVID as a real test, but we will now look um, at inflation, as Professor Lim has said. I think it's um, almost like a déjà vu that we are facing very similar economic challenges, um, very high energy prices. Um, a, um, a wars, I mean, in the 1970s, we had the Vietnam War, which was very close by and I think was very threatening to the region, um, maybe subjectively much more threatening than the Ukraine war right now. Um, we had um, energy prices who ran away, food prices who ran away, and also in Singapore, we had an overheated employment market, so there were um, um, companies didn't have enough workers. Now, in that time, at National Wages war, um, Council was um, started. Now we look today at maybe from Professor Lim's um, inflation is only 10%, not, not 22, you think is very low, but I think for us, for our generation, it's extraordinarily high um, and um, extraordinarily dangerous because neither the employers nor the employees can actually have an answer to inflation. Um, we, we can solve it, and that put it, puts an enormous pressure on the relations between um, employees and employers. And in Europe, if you look at Europe, high inflation has, was always the mother of major conflicts, of major strikes, of major terrorism attacks and upheavals of governments. So to keep it calm right now and to be able to address this um, on a national level um, will probably be um, a huge challenge for tripartite partners and for the National Wages Council. Um, and we are sitting currently, and we discussed it right now, obviously we are, um, some of us here are in, um, in the National Wages Council, and we know how difficult it is because how can the union leaders go back to their constituents and their members and say, look, inflation is 10%, but we can only get 4%. Right? It's a very difficult sell. But how can employers go back to the um, employer's representative and say, look, inflation is 8%. All your cost is rising already by 8%. And by the way, on top, 
we maybe need to raise salaries by 6 or 7 percent in these already very challenging times. So to, to manage this conflict um, is a huge challenge, and um, at the end, government now has to play a very important role. Given that you earlier mentioned the diversity among the various businesses and sectors, um, how um, has, for example, SNEF and you know, yourself, how have you tried to get this internal consensus among the various uh, parties within your constituency? So SNEF has around 3,500 members. We represent, and these members represent maybe around 800,000 employees. So that is less than the union members, and um, I think we are working on it to increase that a little bit. Um, um, legitimization um, of SNEF at the table, you know, our, our leverage, our size at the table has a lot to do with membership, voluntary membership by our companies. So all the members of SNEF are voluntary members, um, and they pay a fee. Um, so within SNEF, we have our industrial relation um, and panels, and we um, have maybe about 20 of these, Yimguan, of the different industries, and um, we have regular, maybe monthly meetings with all these industrial panels, CEOs, um, and um, HR leaders to make sure that we have uh, our, what we call our ear on the grass and that we hear what is growing and what is cooking in the different industries. So therefore, we are responsive. So we feed into these channels the proposed ideas that come out of our various advisory groups and we take out of these panels the information that we get and the worries that we get and the concerns that we get back in the same way that I guess the unions are working with their very many different subunions and um, the union leaders to get information up from the ground. So um, quite, quite a deep-rooted um, system to get information from our employers, but we would never say that we reach all employers and that we reach all ideas. And um, it, is a, it is a regular concern, also in NWC, also raised by um, our chairman regularly. SNAF, make sure that you reach your members, make sure that your members implement, and beyond that, make sure also that the many SMEs who um, are local SMEs who are not members of SNAF are still also addressed by the um, recommendations that, that you pick them up and yet you make sure that they also are part of the recommendation and follow the recommendations as much as they can. So it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's very top on our agenda as employers, as a responsibility that we take very, very seriously. Actually, it's mission critical for the justification of SNEF in, in this whole system. Thank you for these insights. Uh, Ms. Chum, would you like to also help us to understand how NTUC does it in regard to the different unions and members? Fairly similar, we have uh, 58 unions, um, but the way, the way we, um, we group them, um, typically we have uh, what we call the LQ, that means the top three leadership of the 58 unions, so that's about 180. These are largely the opinion leaders. Uh, we will have conversation with them to share about the outlook of Singapore and, um, and hear from them what are some of the expectations. But as we said, because um, the performance of the sector the performance of the different industry vary, and within the same industry, the performance of the companies varies. So it's very difficult to, to have one simple description and a uh, fit for purpose and make everybody happy. So we tend to listen to them. It usually comes from uh, probably the middle income group, there are some sets of concerns. Um, and uh, the PMEs, I think the last few years we've been hearing quite a fair bit from the PMEs, because the sensing is that uh, one is a very qualitative guideline, uh, and I think we intended that to be. Um, uh, but um, we do have some recommendation, fairly strong recommendations over the last, last couple of years over the, uh, the, for, for the lower wage and of course for the PWM group. Uh, but the voices from the PMEs has been quite strong, especially when inflation is high. And it's not very helpful because last two years we were hit by COVID um, and hence the increment was quite dismal for most companies. If not, uh, especially for those hard hit sectors, it's almost frozen. So expectations were pretty high. So we typically do the consultations, and we were, uh, we were, we were. I think at NWC settings, uh, we will present our position. NTUC will present our position. I think staff will present our positions. But I think a lot of negotiation actually took place behind the scene. Um, what is probably not known to many is we never have agreement in the first meeting. The long list of the ones and the ask from NTUC and the list of the ask and don't ask from SNEF is a lot. So uh, typically when we come, I think Stephen Lee, you know, right, even the $50, we have so much, so much trouble. If you recall, I think the year 2012, I think it was 2012, when we started with the quantitative guideline, we wanted certainly an X that is much more than $50. And the session, I think my set Jen and Stephen Lee, they almost 
want to bang each other. Uh, so it was not easy. It was not easy. And despite getting the $50, uh, we find that it was not easy to implement. Uh, SNAP feedback to us, companies feedback to us, and the reasons was indeed quite ridiculous. Uh, they are paid fairly. I think then the $50 was spent for 10 percentile, and it was 1000 and below. And the feedback from companies were, they are, I think I pay them a fair wages, or that uh, I'm, contract, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just a contractor. I, my, my principal contractor is not going to give me any pay adjustment, so there's no way I could pay. And many, many other reasons. So I remember the press, uh, I mean, ridiculed the whole NWC saying that what is $50? Uh, I, 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 social media also said, why, why, why is NWC only asking for $50? But despite that, it was so, it was so difficult. It was so difficult to get it. Um, I guess, um, but, but um, of course, uh, employers do see the point why we wanted to move into a quantitative guideline after so many years, after 1985. But because we thought that over the, over the past many years, it has not been quite fruitful in reaping the outcome that we want. So we started with that. And we agree on some principle, because I think the typical perennial concern of the employers is that, are we going to keep asking it, right? This year, 50, are you going to ask 60 next year? Are you going to ask 70 next year? <coughs> Right. I'm sure Stephen will not his head because that was a question he asked. When are you going to stop asking? So we said that we will only stop asking when we are satisfied at where the 10 percentage. Then I think it's open, it's, it's no longer a secret. Where the 10 percentile is 50 percent or the 50 percentile, and the 20 percentile is two thirds of the 50 percentile, then we will, we will be quite satisfied. Before we reached there and when we started 10 years ago, we were far from it. The delta was too huge. And we, need, we, need, we, need, we knew we need to do a lot more. And that was when PWM was introduced and we actually could address a lot of the P20 grower workers. I think the, the fact is that the discussion at the NWC level uh, was not easy, especially at the drafting committee, because we challenged every single word that we use. The word of shall, the word of will, and the word of must. Must you pay or you shall pay? Shall is different from must. Shall, is shall stronger or must stronger? So we keep asking because, and our leaders will check against last year's NWC. Last year you used words like this, why do you change the wording? Is this a different connotation altogether? So we have to be quite particular about certain wordings and what MTI says, what, uh, what the different, what, I mean, the, the, whether it's the estimate of the GDP growth and the expectations. But I thought, I thought um, it certainly has uh, helped to build on a lot of trust. And, and after briefing the, the leaders to get some of the feedback, before we finally end the agreement, we have to go back to our constituents again to give them a rough gauge as in this is likely to be the settlement. Not really the details, but we have to give them a settlement because we need their buy-in. Knowing that once we come with the 180 leadership that we have, they will come down to the, the next level of leadership, which is about 1,002, and the next level, which is 6,000 leaders. And they will have to communicate to their members because there are expectations from the ground. And of course, after NWC release, uh, we, will we will again have this conversation with SNAF SNAP will ask NTUC, so what percentage are you going to, to give? Because we will typically give some quantitative guide, as in, okay, for this year you can ask 4%. And SNAP position is always, if NTUC say 4%, they will minus 1%. They will talk to their employees and say, that, okay, this year you can go 3%, and then allow us some room to negotiate. As, at least the room is not too huge. It's not a case where I ask 5% and they guide and they will give the guidance of 2%, that is too huge. So there are times it's 0.5, but most of the time it's 1. But I think that is helpful, because at, at, I think the assurance that we are given is employers are also hearing from their employers' union, which is Employers' Federation, that this year, because of such climate, you are expected to pay certain X percentage, and they will know that they would have to negotiate with the unions to make sure that we give a fair, 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 fair uh, increase to our workers. So, so it's a lot of communication, uh, getting their buy-in, getting their trust, getting their confidence. And many a times, uh, whatever is the guidelines, they always, often stress that information sharing is important. Uh, they, they, will, they need the process, and they need the process to be a transparent one. And they will really appreciate if the employers could share a lot of information to them to really explain to them the why. Okay? Not about what you are paying, but why you, have to, why you could afford this, or why you are paying this, or why you are doing that. I think the whole process is useful, and I think we do appreciate it. Thank you for that very uh, in-depth sharing. And now to, uh, oh, there's a question, is there? No. Oh, okay, one, one question. Yeah. So high. So tall. Um, I'm Yvonne, um, HR for Rolls-Royce in Singapore. Um, I just, I have two questions. Um, one is, um, of course, you know, for HR, 
uh, we are right in the middle. Sometimes you don't really agree with the lower percentage of increase by the employer. And sometimes we feel that maybe NTUC is being quite um, conservative in their recommendation um, because we want to retain employees, right? So we're always stuck in the middle and we want to fight a bit more for the employees or we want to make sure that we are able to keep them. Um, how then do we then um, uh, balance that? I think you have shared um, quite a fair bit on it. Um, but I'm curious in terms of 2023. Um, has the tripartite or the NWC finalized their recommendation? Is it going to be conservative or generous for 2023? When will it be published? Because we take the guidelines quite seriously, I think, for HR because it's really a guide to talk to our employers, to talk to our uh, counterpart in uh, HQ. So that's one question. The other question is, I'm curious, how does all this fit into all the news that we have been hearing about the ministry giving 5% to 12% increase in salary, 5% to 14% increase in salary? Because we take all this um, market data to also look at proposal for the companies. Um, and looking at how the tripartite work, I'm also curious to hear how, how does it fit into all, all the news that we've been uh, hearing. Thank you. Our time is also uh, drawing to a close. I thought uh, maybe I'd give each panelist a chance to both respond to those questions and maybe give a final word of, adv of advice or encouragement to the tripartite partners. So maybe you can start from the other end of the stage first. So Mr. Ong, then Mr. Malkus, Mr. Sia, and then Ms. Chan. Um, you can address the question and also perhaps uh, close off with one final reflection or piece of advice for um, the tripartite partners. Thank you. Well, I'm not involved in this year's uh, deliberation, uh, <laughs> but uh, I just make some observation based on my experience as a union rep and government rep. I think um, given the current situation where inflation is much higher, now I think 5 6%, and also there's recovering mode, but at the same time, employers are also very cautious about costs. My sense is the recommendation probably have to address or take into account of one is that how do you, in a way, help the workers, particularly the low-wage workers, uh, to cope with cost of living and so on? Uh, plus also that uh, given the increase in wages in recent years, particularly in recent months, whether it's from private sector or private sector, I think the market is already there, uh, the adjustment is there. So therefore, NWC has to be, in a way, pr pragmatic enough to reflect that, because you can't have a recommendation which is lower than the market. This is my sense. At the same time, I don't know how they can balance with the concern of employer to maintain their competitiveness, because there's also a wider market there where you have to compete. So uh, I wouldn't envy the, the council member, that particular chairman. I think it's, a, it's not easy. But if you can do that, and I believe that you can do that, then the NWC has will be able to achieve a great objective in this case. Because really, to balance the three, and there means three things. Employers' concern, emp employees' concern, and the economy's concern, government's concern. I mean, that's my general comments. Um, I happen to be in the National Wages Council, and I would like to be there next year again. So therefore, I'm not going to say anything <laughs> 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 about um, what the recommendations will be, because I think we are still under confidentiality. Um, but no, we um, um, and definitely it was um, um, very challenging elaborations, and um, definitely we have um, um, come out with uh, with solutions and answers, um, which then the respective stakeholders, the unions, and um, we also as employers, will need to um, communicate well to our constituents. Um, as a concept, uh, maybe just one thought, um, because it might be a little bit counterintuitive, um, to, um, about low wage workers. Um, I want to say something because I think it's, it's very important. And um, as employers, um, we are often asked, why do you support quantitative wage increase? Why do you in, in support the high percentages for lower workers? Because, of course, there are still some industries and companies who overly rely on low wage workers. Right? So if you have MNCs who maybe have one or two receptionists or a driver or a postman or a tea lady somewhere there and, and they, they are considered low wage workers, doesn't matter to them, but you still have certain groups. However, I think for employers, and that's really my message to all the employers, the plea for low wage workers is our business case 
as being part of this economy. Because if we have inequality, if we don't have an inclusive Singapore, the whole business environment will suffer and all employers will suffer. So therefore, it is absolutely critical that employers, and I think for SNEF, we really stand up for this, we all look at this together and make sure that we don't have disconnected, very low-wage receiving members of our society who, are, who don't feel that they participate in our growth of the nation. And, and that is what this is about. This is why we support 50, 60, or 70 dollars, whatever the numbers are. Um, because it strikes to the core, because if we have unrest, if we have dissatisfaction, if we maybe have disruptive elections, then we really have no case at all anymore for um, our businesses. And that's why this case is so important. So that's just one message on lower wage workers in this very difficult time, particularly now with inflation, and we are addressing that in the NWC, because it is no secret that the very low wage workers are also most hardest hit um, by high inflation. Well, I'm afraid <coughs> we cannot share with you uh, the NWC's recommendations, which are coming out soon, sometime this month. Uh, but as usual, I think <coughs> just a general, uh, I would say, uh, statement to all parties. The macro picture is very important to Singapore. Uh, inflation is, 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 is a very serious issue globally. On top of that, we have rising geopolitical tensions, which also has an impact. To Singapore, which is a very open economy, these two issues are very challenging. And we assume that employers and employees will take that into consideration when they look at their expectations. Uh, and I think uh, other things which which continue to be very important for 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 Singapore is is, is how we uh, reskill our workers to the changing economy. So when you are in HR, it is not just the dollars that you spend on salaries; is how much you actually spend on training, reskilling your workers. Uh, for many SMEs, uh, they need to know how to take advantage of government schemes to train and reskill their employees. So I think if you, so generally speaking, as I said earlier, we've gone through two very difficult years of the pandemic, where uh, companies would have suffered but employees would have also suffered quite enormously and those issues have to be addressed. But as always, the NWC asks that companies look at their own circumstances. Their own circumstances to determine how they want to address their employees, how they ought to address their issues and also to always remember that if sacrifices were made during difficult years, there must always be a payback. That's been quite a fundamental call all these years by the NWC. Then beyond which I can only say, you know, uh, wait for the press conference. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Hi. Um, I, earlier, the um, there was a comment that um, um, NTUC was being too conservative. Uh, in fact, I'm trying to understand that. How aggressive do you expect NTUC to be? Uh, then I, I would like maybe SNEF, please enroll our friend here into the SNEF, uh, into the NWC. <laughs> so that they could have experienced as uh, what actually transpired during the meetings. 
Um, then back to back to I, I think it's not the first time. Uh, Sharon is sitting next to her. Sharon is from um, also the aviation side. Likewise, Ross Royce is aerospace side. Last two years was difficult years. Okay, so typically if we were to look at NWC guidelines, you give good wage increases. We do not specify whether it has to be six percent, ten percent, or twelve percent, and but it must commensurate with the company's performance. If sets feel that they are doing very well this year and uh, it's a it's a broken record, broken. I mean, we have we have we have achieved achieve eighty percent of the. I mean, there are some indicators that we have, and we want to reward our workers more. Please do so because the unions will be negotiating based on the. I mean, by the output, by the by the flow of the traffic, and then we will have some indicators to negotiate. Um, so, so NWC doesn't quite give quantitative for that, but NWC did give some quantitative guidelines for the lower wage. So we, we typically reference, if we are expecting uh, $70, if I use $70, uh, for, for let's say less than $1,008 or less than $2,000. If you have colleagues of co-workers who are earning slightly beyond, beyond that, we typically, will, for companies that are doing well, I'm sure we will use a percentage of that to see how you could therefore uh, pay reasonably well to the higher income group. May not be the same percentage because of uh, seventy dollars or eighty dollars for someone that's earning thousand two, it could be it could be eight nine percent. But if the company is not quite prepared, don't have the don't have the budget of eight nine percent. I think this is when negotiation will take place. How much how much are you prepared to pay, and and and, and how you scale it. Um, I think the question on about the salary adjustment that PSD has given, our nurses have given. Actually, over the last two years, in fact, we know many, many other companies have done salary adjustment as well. Um, there was a lack of the last two years, and this and the lack is also partly because we have actually sent back, we have, we have actually lost quite a number of foreign workers. So we don't have enough foreign workers coming in, which is why M1 is now looking at non-traditional source to look at where, where we can get other sources of foreign workers in. But in the meantime, to, to live with the, the, the flow, the stock of the local workforce that we have, and with the the rapid, rapid development of a lot more technologies, people are more taggy, that is, and expectation of wage increases, wages have gone up. So there are a fair bit of adjustment. But we don't look at salary adjustment. So the union's position is that I will not look at salary adjustment. Okay? If you make salary adjustment or market adjustment because you need to do that, and in most cases, you don't adjust across the board to everyone. Uh, those are salary adjustments of certain professions that have lagged behind. But wage increases is one to compensate workers for the work done, not so much for the work done, for the coming year. I think, I think that's quite common in most of the industries. So we don't quite link both two. Unless the company is telling us that we are going to make a salary adjustment of 20% across the board, we can take that into consideration. But many a time, we, that will not be the SI that we agree that is going to be for this year. Because if, if I, I, I think Ross Royce is unionized under you, CCU, you probably know how it works as well. So, so, so um, um, when, why, why I mentioned about um, salary adjustment, when company makes salary adjustment, it is when, it is when uh, we, uh, the conversation that we often have with the employers, uh, we look at salary adjustment and we also ask for CPI adjustment. So for years like this and last year, when CPI, when inflation is high, uh, we will expect that the unions will typically, or your workers, even without the unions, where workers will really appreciate if the companies can give them some form of lump sum. And that is something that we also spelled out quite clearly in the NWC guidelines. And the message is to everybody. Okay, in unionized companies, certainly we will talk to, the, talk to our companies. But for those that are non-unionized, we certainly hope that the employees will take a look at the guidelines and do something that is fair to their workers. Okay, whether they do pay or they do not pay, uh, to be very honest, um, if they are not unionized, we can't help them. And, and it has to be our bargaining tool to actually convince the workers to join the union. Because if you are not union, the companies don't pay you, too bad, I can't help you very much. I mean, I mean that's, that's a fact. So, um, I think just earlier on, um, Terence asked a lot of questions, uh, address this, address that, and give a reflection. I can't quite remember what you asked. <laughs> but, um, but I do appreciate that over the years, um, I think when we, some of us who first joined uh, this labour movement or joined this community, we have very little understanding of what tripartism is. And many a times, our sense is that tripartism seems to work fairly well at the highest level. But for it to really, how it, how it, how it transcends to the, the company's level and to the ground where people appreciate, it's not easy. It's not something where you just read on the paper and you assume tripartism prevails everywhere. So that we need to put in a lot of effort to really build that relationship. 
at, at the company's level, I think we can probably say, I have a lot of my colleagues here and my CC members are here, that we do have fairly good uh, LMR with the companies. There are times management are a little bit difficult. There are times you meet with not very reasonable union leaders. I think these are all understandable. Each will have its role to play. As long as end of the day, we do agree that we do have common objective, that no workers will want the company to fail. And the companies, when you do well, please be fair to the workers. And if we continue to have this good faith and this goodwill in us that we are all here to survive and we are all here because we want our economy to grow, we want our, company, our workers to thrive, then I think we will have a long, long way to go. Thank you. Well, I'm we've uh, overrun the time, but I think you all can agree with me that this has been the most productive discussion uh, this afternoon where we have reflected on the impact of the NWC and how it can remain relevant to the future. So on that note, could you join me in thanking the four distinguished panelists? <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you up to our panelists and to our moderator as well for the very insightful, very frank discussion. I'd like to invite you back uh, off the stage, back to our seats. At this time, we are coming, to the, coming close to the end of our event this afternoon. I'd like to, it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Felix Ong, Program Director of the Tripartite Collective, to de deliver his closing remarks, please. Mr. Ong. Tripartite partners, uh, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, uh, I hope you have enjoyed the program that we have um, lined up today for the Tripartite Collective um, dialogue session about wage. Um, on behalf of the Tripartite Collective, I'd like to um, thank the LKYSPP team, Prof uh, Ng Kok Ho and his team, for working with us very closely to come to produce a case study. And to also to Professor Danny Kwa and Professor Terence Ho for helping to moderate the sessions. I hope uh, you have enjoyed the discussion so far. Um, the first panel discussion, I think we have learned, uh, I, I personally have been captivated by the personal sharing and reflections from Professor Lim Chong Ya and Lim Pin about how it evolved, how NWC in the formation years evolved. It's about survival as a nation. It is about um, how we can actually move from stage of confrontation to building trust, how we build unity, how we built that common imperative for Singapore to succeed. So that's how we got going together. So these are re really powerful lessons that I take away from the first panel session. For the second panel session, uh, I would like to thank uh, the panelists, um, Mr. Ong Yen He, uh, Hui Fong, Mr. Alex Melchers, and Mr. Peter Xia for giving us an insight about the inner workings of our NWC, how they are able to keep their constituents strong, how they are able to rally their troops, how we are able to implement orderly wage adjustments in Singapore. So um, I would like to you to join me in showing appreciation to all our panelists for today. <laughs> 2022 has been a challenging year for all of us. Well, we are facing geopolitical tensions. We are facing, um, we are having a war in Ukraine. We are facing macroeconomic challenges with high inflation and interest rate. 2023 will be an equally challenging year. Chaplet partners are actually prepared for a, a, a brand new year ahead. Uh, on a positive note, I think uh, this will also be an opportunity for us to come together to see how we can solve problems at the macro level and on the ground. It is the aim of the Tropotite Collective to bring together Tropotite leaders from the past, present and future to share our ideas and perspectives. So do look out for our programs lined up in the 2023 in the years ahead. Uh, with this, I would like to wish all of you a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ong. Now, on behalf of the Tripartite Collective, once again, we would like to thank everyone for showing up today, for being here at, and giving your ideas, sharing your ideas, our panel members, our moderator, as well as the questions from the floor. We hope you have found the event insightful, you have gleaned many wonderful insights and takeaways from the topics shared and presented this afternoon. Now, we'd like to appreciate if you can take a few minutes to give us your feedback and by scanning the QR code that's shown on the screen so that we can, we can better see how we can improve the organization of this event. You can find the QR code as well, pasted on the different pieces of paper, on the wall, around the room. Once again, we thank you for choosing to spend your day with us this afternoon here at the Tripartite Collective Dialogue. We hope to see you at the next Tripartite Collective event. Thank you and stay safe. <laughs>